And it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Stephen Estes Smargiasi. Uh, he graduated actually with degrees from both MIT and Harvard, and he's the Director of Planning and Sustainability at the MWRA. Uh, I just want to ask one quick question. Who here does not know what the MWRA does? Don't be nervous. That's, this is good. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, We're winning. Yeah, I mean, I'll admit, one year ago when I was sitting in the Saudis forum here, I did not know what they did. Um, I'm sure Stephen will tell us all about that. One thing I want to mention, he's been at the MWRA for 29 years, which is longer than I've been alive. Oh, where did you go? Um, <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to, Stephen has a wealth of experience and a perspective that is probably one of a kind and looking forward to hearing about it. Up my slides. So following George is, uh, is a trip in itself. Um, so as you can imagine. So I'm going to take a slightly different uh, tact. We've been around for 31 years as the MWRA. We were created just as uh, George was brought in to solve huge problems at DC Water. We were brought in to recreate a multi-century year old water and sewer system. So perhaps a little bit of what I'm going to talk about now is what happens when you take that creativity and the energy, you recreate an organization, and you list all the problems, you set some priorities, and move forward to fix them. So here goes. Here's what we've done in the last uh, few years. Um, and it works, this works out well. One generation, so from a total disaster before you were born to, uh, I think, a pretty good agency where people know what we do. And we no longer need to have police officers accompany us when we go to public meetings. So progress. So we, we're the regional wholesaler. We supply water to 60, and sewer service to 61 cities and towns in the metropolitan area. Uh, we've been doing that in one shape or form since the 1790s. Um, and I'll show you a piece of uh, pipe from the 1790s in a little bit. Um, we are wholesale only, water and sewer. We sell to cities and towns. We don't sell to individual customers. But unfortunately, everybody knows who we are in the Boston area because uh, we have graciously accepted the burden of every rate increase that the city of Boston or the city of Melrose needs to do. They can blame it on us uh, because we've been investing those ratepayer dollars and changing things. We deliver about 200 million gallons a day of wa drinking water each and every day, a peak um, somewhat larger than that. We accept as wastewater to our one second largest in the country, uh, wastewater treatment plant at Deer Island, uh, 350 million gallons per day. But on a rainy day, it's going to go up to 1.2 billion gallons out there. So it's a big system. Um, gravity is our friend. I'll show you some pictures of that a little bit later. Uh, great reservoirs out west, about 65 miles west of here, uphill. Water flows into the metropolitan area. Wholesale system, been around a long time. We sell to the cities and towns. We just went through an election cycle. I Dismal quiet for that. Um, back in the 1980s, water and sewer systems influenced an election. Many people think that the beginning of the end for Mike Dukakis was when George Bush came out, stood on the shores of Boston Harbor, and said, it's the dirtiest harbor in America. Why would you want this man to be your president? A little cleaner than our most recent presidential discussions, a little bit more substantive, but we had one of the dirtiest harbors in the country. It looked like this. Uh, you can't read this sign, or actually I can read it. Water polluted today. This poor guy's down there in the South Boston beaches. He's told that he can't go in the water. Um, they want to swim in South Boston every day of the year, as you've probably seen from the New Year's polar bear swim. It was a mess, raw water pouring into the harbor daily. We had two plants um, which didn't work basically from the day they were built. That's what happens when you don't have the best engineering staff um, and the best contracting processes and the best construction inspection. You build things and they don't work. Um, raw sewage pretty regularly dumped in the harbor. And from a design perspective, they weren't great. For those of you who can see it, this is one of our treatment plants down in Quincy. And there's where the wastewater is discharged. You'll notice it's not the same color as the water around it. Um, that's not a good idea. Two obsolete wastewater treatment plants, 1984, something needs to be done. 15 years later, on time, on budget, do not underestimate how hard it is to do that, what it takes to get there. We hired a lot of people. Um, the most expensive person in state government was the man who ran this project. 
more than the governor, more than the UMass folks. I think more than, at that point, the football coach at UMass, uh, no longer true. Um, brand new plant, second largest in the country, huge. We discharge not 90 feet off of the island in Boston Harbor, but nine and a half miles out in the Mass Bay to take advantage of the dilution. Major improvement. So what do you see? Solids. This is a basic reduction, enormous reduction in solids. George talked about metals. We do have a lot of industry here in our service area. It's a lot bigger uh, than DC losses. Metals in the harbor, way down, significant improvement. Well, what's that mean for the folks who experience it on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, you can see your feet if you wade out on the beaches now. You couldn't do that in 1985. What's the fastest growing zip code in New England? Boston Harbor Edge. Folks have turned their, had turned their back on the harbor. When I moved to Boston to come to MIT in the 1970s, people didn't want to live along the waterfront edge. That was where all the industrial stuff was. Now the most expensive homes in the Boston area border the harbor. Kids can go to the beach. People want to live there. People want to work there. This is MIT. Got to have some data. Can't just have pictures. So here it is, GIS, good, good way to look at things. Um, the more colorful the picture is, the worse this picture is. Purple, bad. Dark purple, dark red, real bad. Before, after. Invest a few billion dollars, three and a half billion dollars, you can make a huge improvement in the environment. Engineers, some of them who came from here, take a look at this evaluate it, it's two sides of the story, both want to improve the harbor and then demonstrate that you've improved it. If you want to have one thing that will help people understand why their rates went up by a factor of 10 in a decade or so, show them that there's been a benefit. Show them that they can use the harbor. The other big issue, besides the fact that we had those obsolete wastewater treatment plants, is that here in metropolitan areas, as in many old metropolitan areas, we have what were called combined sewers stormwater and wastewater, sanitary waste, in the same pipe. Works great on a dry day. All that waste, any stormwater runoff from the street, someone washing their car or whatever, goes out to the treatment plant. If you're doing a good job of treatment, this is wonderful. Not so good on a rainy day because you can't treat all that water. There's not enough room in the pipes for it. Goes overboard, discharged into the Charles River, the Mystic River, the Ponset River, into the bay, pollutes it. Significant issue. Made a couple of decisions. One was that everybody would help pay for it because it all flows downhill to Boston anyway, and all those combined sewer communities right in the core. And having pushed very, very hard to convince EPA that in fact one size should not fit all, we were able to tailor our program to where it was necessary. If you're discharging into the shipping channel, that ought to be a lower priority and require less resources than discharging onto an urban beach where the folks who could take the subway there are gonna go swimming. Different, implement, different requirements for different situations. Now, it's like rocket science, right? A lot of work was necessary to make that change at the regulatory front to allow it. But once we made the change, we were able to tailor our solutions to the specific area. Some numbers, 88% reduction in CSO volume from before we started the program, and what's left is essentially all treated. So if you're taking stormwater and a little bit of stormwater and sanitary waste is being discharged someplace in the metro area on a really big storm, not a little storm, but a really big storm, it's gonna be treated, screened and disinfected, almost all of it. Very, you have to have an enormous storm now for us to discharge untreated waste. The Charles River is better than it's ever been. When I came to MIT, if you wanted to be on the sailing team, you needed a whole slew of what we would now call international travel third world shots in order to be on the sailing team because you shouldn't, but you would, spill your boat and get wet and ingest some of that water. So you needed to think you were going to some third world country to sail on the Charles. Not true anymore. You can go swimming on the Charles almost all the time. Urban beaches. South Boston, these are beautiful. If you haven't taken the subway to South Boston uh, in the spring when the weather gets a little warmer, you should go there. Miles of urban beaches, 
accessible to the entire city. You don't have to drive to Cape Cod. You don't have to go far away. You can take the subway or a bus or walk to a beach. If that beach is polluted, that is a crime. It should not be happening. We as a civilization, we as a society should not allow that. So the highest priority for us was seeing if we could find a way to clean up those beaches. We're not a stormwater agency, but we agreed that we would deal with the local stormwater there as well as the CSOs. Tunnel boring machine, nice little, very difficult to bore tunnel, a few hundred million dollars, and what's the result? Some pretty pictures here of graphs. Beaches are way better than they used to be, but this is what you want. This is why we've changed our mind. Newspaper stories are okay. If you can get a story like this, which says that that urban beach in South Boston is better than Waikiki, that's great. That's the story I like. That's the kind of headline I want. Make an investment, find a way to tell the story effectively, make sure that it ends up in the newspaper. So in some cases, you're gonna be discharging the little tiny streams. Putting stuff in the harbor is pretty good, you get a lot of dilution, but if you're discharging what used to go to the treatment plant, taking that stormwater out, separating we call that, and discharging it to a local stream, if you've been up to the Cambridge area to the Alewife Brook, it's a brook, it's only a few feet wide, you don't wanna dump all that stormwater in there untreated. Now you could do something industrial up there by Alewife, big concrete building, treat it, Instead, what we were able to do here was we built not just a wetland, but a wetland with recreational resources and interpretive materials all the way around it. Little amphitheater that's regularly used for science classes locally. Huge improvement to the neighborhood, huge improvement to the environment, and a legacy from an environmental perspective of cleaner water being discharged in and less flooding, also a concern when you move things. We're not done on the wastewater side. I'm not gonna talk about this much, but we are still spending a lot of money. We know that we got a lot of old pipe. We've been putting in substantial investment. Our recycle rate, our return rate is not 300 years anymore. That's where we were a few years back. We're down well below that. We're trying to get that median age down as best we can. And we have one of the most sophisticated maintenance management systems in the country to make sure that things that we built actually stay running. It is a crime to take your ratepayers' money, build something shiny new, and then slowly let it drop into non-functioning. That's what a lot of organizations unfortunately do. It's easy to build. It's like ribbon cuttings. It's like naming bridges. Those are good. It's easy to get the money to build it. It's hard to maintain the impetus to keep it running long, long after the gloss has gone off. Sophisticated maintenance management system, a high priority for our board of directors to make sure things continue to work. Shift gears a little bit. So we've sort of at the downhill end of the system. Um, knowing that George was gonna talk a little bit about wastewater, I figured I'd get the wastewater out in front. So let's talk about water. We have one of the best systems in the world. Um, folks who designed the system long before um, any of us were here uh, did a great job siting reservoirs, building reservoirs out in central mass, huge reservoirs, multi-year storage, well protected, some pretty pictures. It's a civil engineering marvel. When I started, I used to do a little bit of what George would do, go to meetings and wave my hands a lot and say, we got this awful situation, the system's falling apart, you know, it's built before the Civil War, we got all those same pipes. One of my predecessors used to say, when Lincoln was here campaigning, that pipe was already past its useful life. It's true, it's actually that pipes are still in service now. Um, the old stuff, but it was beautifully designed. It was an amazingly designed, amazingly constructed 19th century system in 1985 when we took over. Still running, but running only because it was well built and designed, hadn't been maintained. Lots of pipes, lots of pumps, and all that good stuff. Um, and you can see the water runs downhill from Quabbin into the metropolitan area, and I'll come back to that. It's a great thing. Gravity is our friend. I'm gonna work my way from the west, from where the reservoirs were, to the east and talk a little bit about what we've done. We've invested a lot of money in, in making sure that our water supplies are well protected. Bought land out there, removed farms, made sure that the sewage that is generated in the small number of folks who live in the watershed is taken out of the watershed and pumped off, off reservoir to be treated elsewhere. 
lots of effort to make sure that the water quality in the reservoir itself is high quality. Well-protected watersheds mean high quality source water. It's worthwhile doing that. High quality source water means that you can do state-of-the-art treatment at relatively little cost. We are one of the few places here at the MWRA, here in the Boston area, that's not required to do filtration. We do not have to add a lot of coagulants to the water and then run it through multiple steps, highly energy intensive, to pull things out of the water. If you don't put it in in the first place, you don't have to take it out. All we need to do is disinfect the water. We do it pretty high tech. We use ozone, pure oxygen and electricity, generating ozone and ultraviolet light, natural sunlight disinfection with a little bit of uh, human intervention, treats the water and it's well done at a relatively low price. Once the water's treated, you got high quality water, you got well protected sources, it's been treated well, you gotta get it in the metropolitan area. One of the biggest challenges we faced as an organization when we started in 1985 was that there was really only one way for water to move from our reservoirs out in central mass into the Boston area. Built in 1940, the Holtman Aqueduct was originally supposed to have two barrels. What happened shortly after 1940? Built one, World War II happened, things got diverted, resources to the war. What happened after World War II? Now, we were civil engineers working on water, and if you look at your MIT history, you can, you can see how this happened. Civil engineers working on water, we were top dog in the teens, 20s, and 30s. That was where it was happening. We were protecting public health, improving the environment, lots of good stuff happening. Post-World War II, where did all of the civil engineering energy go to? Who was top dog? Highways. highways. Now we've, I, I didn't include it in this presentation. We have a great picture. There's a huge highway interchange at Route 90, Mass Pike, and Route 128, Route 95. That highway interchange sits on top of land we bought for connections to our aqueduct system. And it was taken away and they built the highways on top of it. They didn't even leave us enough room to run the second pipe through the interchange. It went from top dog to the bottom of the barrel. So we had a leaking old pipe, only way to get water in the metropolitan area. If you wanna really screw things up, don't turn off water to just a few homes or a few hotels in one part of town. Shut off the whole metropolitan area for a few weeks. If this pipe failed, we thought it would be something on the order of a month or more where we weren't able to supply water in metropolitan Boston. So we built a new tunnel in parallel to that. We now have redundancy from the treatment plant into the metropolitan area. If you're interested in that kind of civil engineering, in the next few years, we are thinking about how to provide redundancy to the rest of the tunnel system inside the metropolitan area. This was about three quarters of a billion dollars. We're gonna spend about one and a half over the next 20 years or so, providing redundancy in the metropolitan area. So you get the water into the metropolitan area. Typically, you've got storage facilities because there's a downhill curve. You use more in the daytime than at night. Water's hard to move, moves steadily, fills the reservoirs at night, uses them in the daytime. When I started at the MWRA 29 years ago, all of the water, essentially 90 some percent of the water that passed into the metropolitan area, passed through an open reservoir that looked like this. And this is not some swimming hole. This is drinking water. Now it's really nice and clean, it's beautiful. How do you feel about these kids swimming in drinking water that's gonna go directly from here to your home? Not so good. That's not good. Didn't require, you do not need a degree from MIT to know that that is not a good idea. So we've removed all of those open distribution reservoirs, moved them into backup supply available in a dire emergency, built some really beautiful concrete tanks and put meadows on top of it. What's the most neglected ecosystem, ecological niche in, the, in any metropolitan area? It's meadows. Got lots of lawns, got lots of trees. You don't have much in the way of meadows. We've built a lot of good meadows for ecological restoration, providing habitat for certain um, birds and other, other organisms that don't go anywhere else. Great system, makes the water safer, we were able to say post 9-11 that all the water that leaves the reservoir doesn't see the light of day until it opens up in your tap. It's a lot safer than it would be otherwise. All right, so we've stored the water, we've got it pretty clean, and now we have to figure out how to get it into your home. Now, I can say with a moderate degree, moderate degree of assurance that we no longer have any wooden pipe. 
This is a piece of the Jamaica Plain Aqueduct late in 1795 that's actually sitting on a file cabinet in my office. I paid a pretty penny to win that at auction. But there is a lot of stuff that looks like this still. We might not have much in the way of wooden pipe out there in service, but we have a lot of old cast iron mains. And that's what they look like on the inside. These are six inch mains pulled out of the city of Boston. Part of our research program, a lot of good work done on those mains to demonstrate how you can run a system when it's a substantial chunk of the pipe is gonna look like that. And no matter how fast you invest, there's gonna be a lot of that pipe in the ground for a long time. Metropolitan area wide, we're spending a lot more than a tenth, uh, a quarter, or a third of 1% on piping. Um, on the Boston system, we were up at about 2.5%. On the metro system, 2.5%. City of Boston was doing 1.7, trying to catch up. When I came on board, our median age was over 80 years. We've driven that down somewhat, uh, but there's a long way to go on that. One of the things that's interesting is the money that we could have spent on treatment had we not had high quality sources, we were able to convince our stakeholders, including the regulatory agencies, and ultimately, unfortunately, a federal judge, because some of those regulators, they really like to sue you. So we were able to convince not only our regulators, but ultimately a federal judge that we should take the money that we would have spent on the kind of treatment that folks who have water on the Mississippi River or the Ohio River, and not build that treatment, build less expensive treatment, take that money and invest it in pipes. So we have a program my staff run where we lend zero interest money to the cities and towns in the metropolitan area to help them get over the hump locally of convincing their ratepayers that they should replace those pipes. More recently, we've done the same thing. Uh, back in this, uh, over the winter, back in February, our board of directors decided that we would put aside $100 million in zero interest loans to help the cities and towns in the metropolitan area that still have lead service lines let no good crisis go, go unused. It's one of my favorite phrases as well. Flint, Michigan's a total disaster. Ask me questions later about that. You really don't want to think about that um, in great depth about how not to run a system. We use that, that crisis elsewhere to convince our board and to convince our ratepayers that this is a good thing to do. And we're going to be money going out the door probably in the next couple of weeks. You'll see in the newspaper some big checks. We do the same thing uh, to invest in lead service line removal. What's the story? You invest in new treatment, help get lead service lines out, and you see progress like this, 90% reduction in lead levels in worst case homes. If you look at non-worst case homes, even better story than that. All right, so um, George already mentioned we use a lot less water than we used to use. When I started, I actually came to the MWRA to run our conservation programs. Our board of directors was faced with the fact that we were using 10% more than we could reliably remove from our sources. They wanted to not think about building new sources, because politically we were investing all our energies in cleaning up Boston Harbor. Was there a way to solve that problem that didn't involve having to fight politically with the western part of the state? They asked us to try out water conservation. My mandate when I came on board was to do one of two things, succeed at reducing demand to below the safe yield, or succeed at convincing the environmental act activists, the agitators, that we had tried hard enough that we could go and go to a new source. I didn't know which way it would go, but we tried. And here's what we, happened. Conservation, in fact, does work. It helps if you raise the rates by a factor of 10 while you're trying to convince people to conserve. You definitely get their attention. Now, when I talk to my friends who are economists, they talk about price elasticity. And I talk about going to public meetings. It's a big difference between an academic discussion of price elasticity and going to a meeting where you say 10th, 12th, 14th, 15th year in a row, we're raising your rates. I think of it as raise the rates gets their attention. You better offer them a way to save water because otherwise they're just going to be mad at you. Water conservation works. means a lot of things we're building now are smaller than it would be otherwise. This is my favorite of all my data charts. It's my favorite. City of Boston has not changed its geographic boundaries during a century and a quite a bit, going back to before 1900. Boston today last year, last couple of years, is using less water than it used before 1900. Pretty cool. Efficiency, some change in industry, but a lot of attention to wasting less and using what you do use more efficiently. So that's water, great. You know, we get it all the way in. We have enough of it. It's safely delivered. But water and wastewater use about 2% of the energy in the US. We are, we are, our Deer Island treatment plant is the single biggest user in the metropolitan grid. It's a big deal. 
We spend about 40 million, we have a $40 million energy budget, about $22 million worth of that energy comes from renewable sources. Well, the first reason that that works is that 85% of our water flows downhill to the customers by gravity. Not only does it flow downhill, but we can steal some energy as it happens and generate some money. So that's a good thing. We try and generate hydro at every opportunity we can. If there's a place to squeeze some energy out of the water as it moves downhill, from Quabbin Reservoir towards Wachusett, we steal some energy out of it. From Wachusett to the treatment plant, we steal energy. From one hill in Weston to another hill in Weston, we steal some energy out of it. When it gets all the way down to the bottom of the basin at Deer Island, and before we put it in the tunnel to go nine and a half miles out into the bay, we steal some more energy out of it, generate energy out of that. It's great that you guys are using your methane. Uh, when our plant was designed back in the 1980s, uh, we put this in already. We're about to start thinking about how to do this more in more modern ways. We had room for the egg-shaped digesters. It was good. Um, so when you fly into Boston, you're flying over uh, sludge being digested 18, 20 days. Um, generating methane, we use essentially all of that methane. It's tracked on a regular basis in charts that we produce in our management indicators. And that avoids the purchase of 5 million gallons of fuel oil and generates a huge amount of energy at Deer Island. About 26 or 27% of our electricity on any given day at the plant is generated on site and all of our heat is generated on site. Solar power, it's not huge, but it's beautiful, and we get some free energy out of it when it's operating. We've put those in all over the system. Wind power, even better than solar or, or hydro. People see it, they know you're doing it. If you can put up a wind turbine, you'll feel green. Um, these show up in all, if you go on the web, you see these pictures all over the place. Um, they generate a reasonable amount of energy when the wind is blowing. Uh, but they're, if you can get someone else to help you pay for them, they're great. So what do we do? Renewable energy. In the last half a dozen years or so, from 2006 to 2014, we were able to increase our renewable energy by about 31%. If you look at the chart on the lower right-hand side here, um, about 31% of our total energy need comes from green power. Either we use it on site or we sell it to the grid, but about a third of what we need to run the system is being either generated and used locally or generated and because we can't use it right there sold. Big deal, we track this on a monthly basis. It's an important part of our overall message. Um, electrical demand has decreased across the system. We've generated more power. We've become more efficient. It's amazing if you get your, the energy of your staff, the, the thought process of your staff, you empower them to think creatively about how to be more efficient. Ideas pop out all over the place. Some of them make no sense at all until you look closely at it. Who would have imagined that wrapping the water pipes in a pump station could save a huge amount of energy? All the energy's in the pumps, right? Well, it turns out that at a, in our part of the world where the water's cold most of the year, that a big chunk of the energy in a water pump station goes to dehumidification like eight or nine months of the year because if you've got a 55 degree pipe in a pump station and the windows are open, water's gonna be flooding the floor. Wrap the pipes, you can turn off the dehumidifiers. Big savings, lots of things you can do to be more efficient. We've reduced energy use by, I, don't know, I can't read that number, 16%, um, big deal. And bottom line from all of that, as an environmental agency, we're not just interested in water in the environment, but we're interested in greenhouse gases because we can change the future better or worse. If we continue to dump a lot of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere with our operations, we are changing things for the worse. If we can find ways to reduce our greenhouse gases, we're changing things for the better. Uh, we've reduced uh, since 2006 to 14 about 29% reduction in greenhouse gases. And we've done that while we've continued to add new processes and capture more waste. We're doing a better job of what we did in terms of improving the water environment, spending more energy, but we're reducing greenhouse gases nonetheless. Yep, two versions of that. So let's think, lots of people, we're all trying to reduce greenhouse gases, but we're not gonna do it fast enough so the climate will change. And I can say I've dined out on the rubber chicken circuit on the uh, question of who did the first substantive improvement to a concrete facility for climate change adaptation. The Deer Island treatment plant, when it was designed, Back on about page 180 of a 500-page design report, there was four or five pages saying, you know, 
the climate's going to change, sea level's going to rise. What should we do in the plant design to think about 40, 50 years out during the life of the plant? They raised all the process elevations of the plant by 1.9 feet. They slightly increased the diameter of the tunnel because if they hadn't, as sea level rose, the capacity of the plant would drop. The water flows out through that outfall based on the difference between the plant elevation, that last process tank, and the elevation of the sea. If the sea comes out, the capacity of the outfall will decrease, and we won't be able to do as good a job of maintaining a clean environmental record for the Boston area. First place anywhere in the country, I think, first place in the world that someone actually invested real concrete money in climate change adaptation. We didn't stop there. We're looking at all of our facilities. Water flows downhill, so we have a lot of wastewater facilities that are coastal or near coastal. Every single one of these has been evaluated for sea level rise. We're pragmatic. We don't miss opportunities. We didn't wait for a lot of modeling. There are a lot of folks here at MIT who are working on modeling for sea level rise. We picked the number. We said it was going to be in the middle of whatever anybody would come up with. And if it's wrong, we'll change it and go back and do later. We immediately, once we got the permission to go forward, started doing retrofitting. Every single capital rehab project includes sea level rise and energy efficiency in the design. And if we're not going to get around in the next 15 years or so to renovating a facility, our maintenance staff are going out and installing things to make that facility more reliable. Because I don't want to be what happened in New Jersey after Superstorm Sandy, where our facilities are offline for months. We might not be online in a huge superstorm for a few hours or a part of a day, but when the floodwaters recede, we darn well better be operating. That's what our people expect of us. That's what we want to be able to do. So we're doing this. Lots of good stuff going on. So what do we all get? Bottom line, our customers have given us a boatload of money, but they got out of it a clean harbor, rivers that they could swim in, beaches that they can enjoy. Seals came back into the harbor. We see whales. It's way better than it was 25, 30 years ago. We, do, we don't go do quite as much tweeting as uh, DC. I'm not quite sure why that is. So maybe we're a little bit more New England. We're more reserved than they are a little further south. I'm not quite sure if that's it, but we do less tweeting. But we really do invite the public to tour our facilities. You can walk all the way around the Deer Island plant. It's part of the National Park for the Boston Harbors National Park. Many of our facilities are open to the public. Our old aqueducts, if they're not in use, you can walk along it. We've been opening those up. Great opportunity to see where the money went and to enjoy it. If you can get a headline like this, I would love to see it. Um, we were adding a new treatment plant. My boss said it's going to be great tasting water. So of course, the newspapers took him up on it and did a taste test. He was a little bit nervous. He says, I'm just a guy from Medford. I don't know much about tasting. I've got some wine experts here. We came out on top. The only difference between us and the most expensive bottled water was they were more expensive. And the American Water Works Association had their conference here. Every year, the American Water Works Association does a taste test. And in 2014, when they were here in Boston, both the Boston Water and Sewer Commission, one of our, our biggest customer, had water in because as the host city, you get to put your water. We had won the regional contest. Our water was in. We came in one and two. Now, if you've ever done one of these kind of taste testing things, you could put the same water in two different bottles, and sometimes one will come in first and the other will come in 13th. First and second, they actually had a tie and they had to split them, so they were actually distinguishing between all the other waters. And the next year we got third place. The winner each year gets, to be, gets a buy to be in the contest. So my boss likes to say in 13 months we had gold, silver, and bronze in best tasting water in the country. Can't end without kind of a joke. So when I think about what my job is, I think about telling my customers, we got lots of, you know, we got a business plan and it's got lots of stuff in it, goals. My job is to be able to go out in the public and talk to folks and say, you can drink with confidence. We used to have pencils that had that slogan on it, drink with confidence. When you flush the toilet, you should be able to know that you're flushing with pride. You are not polluting Boston Harbor. You are not polluting the Charles River. You flush, it's not just going away, it's generating clean energy, and it's being properly disposed of. Sludge is turning into energy and fertilizers. It's being recycled, reused. You can flush with pride here in the Boston area. Thanks. <laughs>